Good morning, everybody. We are hopefully going to help educate and teach some lessons. And, and we learned a lot of great stuff from Joe. Now I want to roll the clock forward and think about tomorrow, not yesterday and today and what we're doing today. But the world has really changed a lot. And we're going through a great evolution. Um, and, and it's happening everywhere. It's happening in the analytics world. It's happening in the technology world. But most importantly, I think it's happening in the consumer world. So we've come a long way, and we've moved from the, the old days of non-digital to digital. But the digital world is moving, and it's moving faster than anything we've ever seen before. So if we think about it, the consumer has evolved a great deal. And really, the consumer today has great powers. They've become the super consumer, if you will. They can do things that no consumer before us has ever been able to do. Um, the first thing is they have very, very loud voices. So when something goes right or something goes wrong, the world will know about it very quickly. And you don't need to look far to see examples of this, whether it be a YouTube video by a disgruntled United passenger or any other of a number of things that immediately go viral and, and just become a huge, huge issue. So that when we have to really think about how we treat our consumers, because they're not just one consumer anymore, but they're potentially a consumer that has a very loud voice. And at the same time, other consumers have very big ears, so they're hearing everything that's being said. So again, there are no secrets today like there used to be. Consumers also today have a lot more knowledge than they've ever had before. It used to be that if you walked into a, a store, the associate usually knew more about the products than you do. Now, probably not that's the case anymore. And if you don't know more than the associate, you pull out your handy dandy smartphone and you start looking at product reviews while you're literally in the store. So consumers have a lot more knowledge about everything they do. They're able to, to look far and deep and to understand and get lots of different views from lots of different peoples really instantaneously. They also have the ability to clone themselves. And this is really, really important because they can be in two places at once or three places at once. And it might be sitting in front of their TV watching one broadcast station while on their iPad they're looking at another news source. It might be that they are walking down the store of an electronics retailer with a competitor on their smartphone. Or it might just be the simple side of having multiple tabs open in your browser. But they can be in multiple places at the same time. So think about that. In, in most industries, if you roll the clock back 10 or 15 years ago, the most important words, the three most important words were location, location, location. Well, the technology, web, and smartphones have really eliminated that as a key, uh, a key positive and a key way to hold your customers captive. So as we think about this evolution, um, there's a number of things from an analytics space that we really need to think about of how they're evolving and what's going to come next. And it starts with single channel versus multiple channels. Right? So consumers no longer will deal with you in a single channel. Expedia is a multi-channel company. You may think of them as an online company, but they've got a call center. They're a multiple channel. Every company today, just about, I'm hard pressed to think of one that isn't, is multi-channel. Whether it be for service, support, sales, information, content, you name it. So when we have multiple channels, it presents a whole other challenge for us because the experience that happens on one channel only tells us part of the story of that relationship with that consumer. Similarly, it's gotten more complicated because we've gone from single devices to multiple devices. So how many of you browse something online at work, then look at it on your iPhone or your, your Android phone or your tablet on the way home, and then when you get home, you go on another computer and look at it again? So if you were looking at subscribing to a newsletter and you started the process at work and went to a different device and ended up finishing the process, are they able to tie you together? Probably not. Most of those sessions that we see are anonymous in nature. So unless you've authenticated and logged in, you're different people, different experiences, and success and failure become very, very hard to understand. We also see a, a change as we're evolving from a, a captive audience to really people having freedom of choice. Again, based on location, based on the alternatives that are out there, based on the new competitive nature of everything we do, there are a lot more choices than we've ever had before. The barriers for new companies to enter are, are very, very short. Um, and we're able to, to have a lot more choices out there. So it's a lot harder to hold somebody captive, a captive audience, if you will. The next thing that's really changed is as we go from high switching costs to low switching costs. And I think this is probably one of the most important aspects. The cost to switch in most industries and in most businesses is very, very low today. There still are a few industries that are hanging on for dear life, things like brokerage, uh, banking, where it's a little harder to actually move. But in most organizations, in most companies, in most of your businesses, whether it be content, product, retail, uh, many aspects of financial services, it's very easy to switch. The cost to switch is low. 
So again, we've, we've let go of our consumers of being holding them, holding them captive, if you will, where there's a high switching cost for them to move. And that's a very important point. The next thing that we've evolved through is as we go from the company being in control to the consumer in control. They have the knowledge, they're able to switch very quickly, they now really hold the keys to the success of your organization, much more than it used to be. And so we have to treat them a little bit differently. We have to realize that when we mistreat them, they're a voice that's going to touch thousands, if not millions of people. And they become our, both our positive word of mouth, but also our negative word of mouth. So the consumers are now in control like they've never been before. The next piece is as we go from siloed or single channel metrics to integrated metrics or multiple channel metrics. And this is a big issue. Um, a lot of organizations are starting to try to figure this out. But when somebody sees a billboard, is told something by word of mouth, the good old fashioned way over the backyard fence, sees something on Facebook, goes to a website, gets an email, sees ads in the newspaper, they do all those things and yet we're looking at usually just one channel to figure out the metrics. We're looking at one channel to understand the marketing attribution. Do we know if they saw that billboard? Do we know if somebody talked to them and told them this is a great company, you should go check this out? Usually not. And so what happens is often our metrics become very misleading because we're only looking within our silo. And it's a big challenge to go past that silo and look at a true set of metrics that are integrated across channels and touch points. Another aspect is we need to move from feedback to measurement. So it's great to have a feedback mechanism where people can raise their hand and say, I've got a concern, I've got an issue, I've got a problem, or you're doing great. And whenever anybody wants to raise their hand and talk, we want to hear and we want to listen and we want to look at it. But, but really understanding voice of customer goes way, way, way beyond just feedback. We need to measure people. Because to all too often it's the extremes that will give you feedback. And we want to know about the average person as well. We want to know about the people that are in the middle of that bell curve, not just at the outsides. So feedback's good, but we really, really need measurement to understand how to allocate our resources to make the right decisions. And ultimately, how we allocate those resources is going to determine success and failure from a company's perspective. It's also moving from behavioral metrics, and, and Jim and, and Joe also mentioned this, to also behavioral metrics plus that voice of customer. And when we apply a science to that voice of customer, we're able to really understand what people are thinking, what their intent and their purpose is. It's very, very dangerous to look at your web analytics data only and assume what somebody was trying to do on your website. How do you know what they were trying to do? How many people put things in a shopping cart just because they want to see what the price would be or if it's in stock and they have no intent on purchasing? Yet if we make those assumptions, we can get ourselves in trouble. We also want to be able to, to, to not look at VOC, voice of customers, just an art. But look at it as a science. Can we apply a science to it? And in fact, we can. So we're looking at more than just what people said. But we're understanding what their strengths and weaknesses of their experience are. We're understanding what's driving their behavior. We're understanding what their purpose and intent is. It's great to hear people talk. It's great to see those open-ended comments. But if that's all we're left with, it makes it very, very hard for us to apply a science and to make good decisions about where we allocate our resources. So ultimately, as we have all these different things that are evolving, it's things for you guys to think about. Um, I made this comment about a year ago. It, you know, Web Analytics Association should probably change their name. Because if we don't change the name of it, it's probably going to go away. Because the reality, if you guys in three years are a web analyst, I'm not sure you're going to have a job anymore. Because consumers only don't deal with the web. They deal with multiple channels. So you really need to think about how can I move from a web analyst to a business analyst, to someone that's looking at data anal and analytics across all channels. Because those are the people that are going to be in charge. Those are the people that are going to have the knowledge and the intelligence to make decisions. They're going to optimize the business, not just the channel. And we're starting to see that happen at companies. We're starting to see that, that the, the people that are really out in front, that are really winning and competing on analytics, are looking way beyond a single channel. So what we end up with is we end up with really changing from looking backward at a bunch of data and trying to figure out what it told us to being able to use the science to help us manage forward. To use the science to understand if people are satisfied today, they're going to be customers tomorrow. If they completed a transaction yesterday, that's good. But does that mean they're going to complete a transaction tomorrow? So when we can move from just explaining the past to really understanding and managing the future and, and making sure that we're creating the consumer experiences that are going to meet the needs of those users, now we really have something that's powerful, and that will absolutely allow us to compete. And it's what I like to think of, of as we move along the analytics maturity path, 
As we get more mature in it, it's about using that data to set the stage for tomorrow, about using that data to make the decisions about where we're going to allocate our resources tomorrow. So when we think about this, and, and I stepped back and said, OK, so what's the problem? Why is this so hard? Why are so many people having challenges really pulling all of this together? And it comes down to a couple things. I think the most important aspect is that our consumers are multi-channel, both on the acquisition side, through all the different ways that we're touching them from marketing perspectives. Again, the traditional old-fashioned billboards to ads to good old-fashioned word of mouth to high-tech mobile ads, you name it. But they're getting touched by a lot of different ways, and they're interacting with our companies in a lot of different channels as well. But we have these single channel metrics. And this is, I think, the single biggest challenge that we see in the analytics world today, is those metrics are within that channel. And some people are making some great strides to be able to tag their Facebook pages so they can see, oh, this consumer that came to my website visited that Facebook page. But what if they did it on a different device? What if they got information about you through a Facebook post, not visiting your Facebook page, truly social media, viral media. All of those things aren't really being handled, aren't really being adjusted for in the traditional analytics world. So what we end up with is these multiple channel consumers and multi-device consumers. We, we have single channel metrics, and we end up with a lot of misinformation. Someone abandoning a shopping cart that goes to purchase in the store. Someone that goes onto a financial services site, looks at a mortgage application, and abandons it, calls the banking center to find out the hours, and shows up at a branch to get a mortgage. All of those things as they move from channel to channel and device to device, often we're losing control over what that means, what their purpose of, what their intent was. And so we're sub-optimizing a channel. We worked with a retailer that for every dollar being spent by an online consumer, we were able to measure that $9 by that same consumer were being spent in a store. So when they went and talked to management, they didn't talk about marketing costs to drive $1 by that consumer. They talked about marketing costs to drive $10, one plus nine, by that consumer. Because that website was not only contributing to online commerce, but it was con contributing to commerce within the organization. Although that person didn't get credit for that commerce in the store, he was smart enough to know that it was a critical part of his role and his business. So we end up with a lot of misinformation and misguided metrics, and that's a big, big analytics challenge. So what this all means is that in today's world, the consumer experience, the experience that people have, is more important than it's ever been before. And therefore, satisfaction is more important than it's ever been before. Because consumers have those choices. They have freedom of choice in most cases. If you can lock them up so they don't, beautiful thing. If you can get what I call restricted loyalty, where they have no other game in town, that's a beautiful thing. But in most cases, we're not able to do that. In most cases, they truly can switch at very low cost. They can be in multiple places at the same time. So what's going to drive their loyalty? What's going to drive their behavior next time? What's going to drive what they say about you? If they had a great experience, if they were satisfied, if you met their needs and exceeded their expectations. And that becomes a really, really important aspect. And when coupled with behavioral data, it becomes really, really powerful. So why is satisfaction the right thing? Why is satisfaction the thing that we should be thinking about? Well, let's first start by kind of explaining what satisfaction is. Um, most people just think, hey, are you happy or satisfied? It's a lot more than that. Satisfaction is really a combination of the experiences you have and the expectations that you have. So when you walk into a restaurant and they tell you it's a 30-minute wait and you have a horrible experience waiting 20 minutes, it's crowded, it's noisy, people are spilling drinks on you, it's hot, you had a bad experience, even though they met your expectations of 30 minutes. The experience was bad. If you were spent 45 minutes waiting and it was a great environment and they had those free little snacks in front of you and lots of room and the game was on the TV and it was comfortable and you had a place to sit down and get a drink, you're thrilled, right? So it's not only about the expectation or about the experience, it's really the combination of both of those. When you go to a website and it says free shipping on the homepage and you check out and you realize you needed to spend $100 to get free shipping, you're mad. If you went to that website and didn't say anything about free shipping and you checked out and it said, hey, if you spend $100, you get free shipping, you're pretty excited. So it's all about managing that expectations. And unfortunately, there's sometimes a conflict between satisfaction and managing and meeting those expectations and marketing. Because all too often, marketing tries to raise those expectations to places that we can't necessarily fulfill. So something to think about as we think about satisfaction, because the way that that consumer remembers that experience is what's going to determine what they do next and what they say about you in the social world. 
So satisfaction is ultimately going to determine what they do next. The experience they have, how it met with their expectations, and their expectations are being molded at every touch point they have with you, every exposure they have with you, every word they hear about you, be it true or false, that's going to mold their expectation. And when they're satisfied, that's going to determine what they do. And what they do is going to determine if you're successful. If you're financially successful, if that customer is a profitable customer, if you're able to retain that customer and so on. So when we look at customer satisfaction, it really ends up being the key performance metric, we think, right? Because satisfied consumers today are going to be long-term loyal consumers and say good things about you. People that complete a task today have simply completed the task. If they had a good experience, they're going to come back and say good things. If they had a bad experience, they're going to go elsewhere the next time. So when we're measuring success, we all have a lot of internal metrics, whether it be conversion rates, whether it be sales per visit, whether it be pages viewed, whether it be customer lifetime value, all kinds of things. None of those are going to go away. We're still going to manage our businesses with these what I call internally focused metrics. They're key. They're critical. Every organization uses them. Our organization uses them. But when you can complement that and add to the picture that you're measuring success through the eyes of your consumers, now you've got something really powerful. Because ultimately, they're going to determine your success. The most important asset any company has, ours included, it's not your technology, it's not your location, it's not your brand, it's not your products, it's your customers. They're the most important asset you have. Without them, you don't have a business. With loyal customers, satisfied customers, you have a business that will build upon itself because of the power word of mouth. So what's the cost of not satisfying a customer? It's great to think in the positive, and usually we do. We always talk about the value of improving satisfaction. But what's really the cost of not satisfying your consumer? What happens if you don't, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't meet their expectations, if you don't meet their needs? So I'm going to run some data through for you. If any of you guys want this data and you can't keep up with the speed at which I'm talking, we can send you a copy of the, of the presentation. But um, when we look at e-commerce, retail, and we do these industry studies quite frequently, we looked at the top 100 online retailers and determined what's the difference between a satisfied consumer and a dissatisfied consumer. And we looked at those satisfied consumers that scored on a satisfaction scale of 0 to 100, 80 or above, and those dissatisfied consumers at below 70. So we're looking at these sort of extremes of satisfaction, right? Both positive and negative. Those dissatisfied consumers are 61% less likely to purchase if you're a retailer. They're 64% less likely to recommend. They're 60% less likely to be committed to your brand and so on. So when we think about that, there is a huge cost for dissatisfied consumers. If we can eliminate or minimize those, it's obviously going to be very good for our business. The same thing applies as we look at government. We do a lot of industry research in, in the government space, the eGov space, and believe it or not, your federal government cares if you're satisfied when you visit their websites. Um, hard to sometimes imagine that, but it is one of the key metrics they use. And we find the same kind of data. We find that those dissatisfied visitors to those websites are 78% less likely to use that site as a primary resource, which lowers the cost for government and improves the efficiency of our tax dollars. So if you're not satisfied when you're going to look, check on your tax refund and IRS, that's a bad thing. It costs everybody more money. They're 81% less likely to recommend the website, and so on. So again, we see a huge, huge cost of a dissatisfied consumer. When we look at financial services, see similar results. Dissatisfied customers are 65% less likely to purchase additional products from their bank or credit union or financial institution. 65% less. Think about that if you're running that business, if you've got P&L responsibility. They're 76% less likely to recommend the website and so on. When we look at news and information sites, dissatisfied consumers are 71% less likely to recommend that site to others. Really turning positive word of mouth into negative word of mouth. And they're 41% less likely to return to the site. So now as you think about your acquisition costs to get them to visit you, and those that are dissatisfied are 41% less likely to return, think about how that impacts your total cost of business. Think about how that impacts your lifetime value of a consumer when 41% of them are leaving your site and not coming back. So to go a little deeper into some other examples and some other industries, and this is, this is data from some of our clients that we've obviously scrubbed the names so you can't figure out who they are to, to protect their privacy. But at the end of the day, um, in the healthcare world, which are using websites more and more, a health system, 13% of the website visitors couldn't accomplish the task that they were planning to do. And in turn, they ended up calling the provider, right? So the 
opportunity here was if we could reduce that by only 10%, it was going to save $1.7 million in call center costs. That's an incredible payback for getting rid of dissatisfied consumers. It turned out that in this case, the solution was, because it's great to identify the problem, but you've got to have the diagnostic capability to know what to fix, what lever to pull. So the solution in this case is that it took too long and too many people couldn't find to see how they were doing against their deductible and their summary of benefits. So they were able to improve that experience and see that savings, you know, over a million dollars in call center costs. Huge value and really a, a good example of a multi-channel consumer. By improving the website, we were able to lower the cost in another channel. When we look at a product, consumer product company, we found that the website visitors that wanted a free trial, but 14% of them couldn't find what they were looking for, and their satisfaction was 30 points below the rest of the audience. The opportunity with just a 1% improvement for this company was worth 35 million in sales. 1%, 35 million. That's a very, very good ROI. By being able to focus the search results and get them to that process of free trial and making it a more understandable process, they were able to drive up that satisfaction and see the benefits in increased sales. Another retail example, this has to do with an in-store retail. 30% of store visitors who downloaded online coupons, so these are your multi-channel guys, they, they went online, they downloaded a coupon, they were 20 points lower in satisfaction and 44% lower average order size. 10% improvement in this case, $18 million in sales. Survey was not was capturing that there were zip code issues, in, in other words, the, um, the coupons weren't related to where the people lived. So they were going to the stores and it wasn't really aligning with the regional merchandising strategies. So by starting to get those in sync, they're able to see that improvement in satisfaction. They were able to see that improvement in people that were downloading the coupons were actually fulfilling them and were satisfied with the process, and they saw a huge increase in sales. We also found in a different retailer that, that in the store visitors, the visitors that were in the store, the people that were purchased, that wanted assistance but weren't able to find it, and that accounted for 6% of their audience. They had a decline in customer satisfaction of over 20 points and spent 33% lower average order size. If we're able to increase that average order size by 33% for that 6% of the audience, that's increasing revenue by 2%. For a retailer that typically are seeing 3 and 4% year over year growth, to add another 2% of that is almost doubling their revenue, their revenue growth year to year. They needed to improve their staffing and on-floor assistance to make sure that those people were getting what they need. With this data, they were able to determine was that a positive return on their investment. So when we look at those dissatisfied consumers, there's lots of opportunities to focus on those people and really turn things around. But we not only need a great measurement device, a great set of metrics across multiple channels, we also need the diagnostic capability to be able to drill in and really understand what those drivers of that dissatisfaction are. So the analytics challenge, right? We have a lot of different points of analytics. We think of an ecosystem of really having four components. The first being the behavioral data, financial data, traditional web analytic data, clickstream data, task transactions, really, really important. And it's going to do a great job of telling you what people have done on your site or on your mobile device. Satisfaction is going to be a little bit more forward looking. It's going to be talking to people, applying a science to the measurement of satisfaction so that we understand what their intent was, we understand whether we satisfied them, we met their expectations and what they're going to do next. If they're satisfied today, they're going to be a, a long-term loyal customer, more profitable customer in the future. Observation, we need to get down to the level sometimes of seeing an individual. Most analytics analysis ends up with a segment. We look at a segment and we say, for this segment, this is the problem. Sometimes we need to go down and actually watch somebody use our site, use our mobile devices so that we can actually see what they did and we can figure out the solution. So by bringing good observation capabilities and technology to the table, you're able to do that. Finally, feedback. Feedback is good. Everybody should have it, but it's not measurement. It has a tendency to be very reactive. When someone tells you something is broken, you can go fix it. But how long was it broken before they told you? How long was that link broken before you knew about it? How long was that, that item missing on that wedge page before you knew about it? If you're measuring people, you're going to get those answers a lot quicker. If you get those answers quicker and you can fix things quicker, that has a compounding positive impact on your ROI. The key is trying to integrate these things together. The key is using all of these analytics in the ecosystem so you can really figure out how to make it work for your business. The, the areas in red are places where 4C plays, and, we, and our goal with our, all of our clients is to try to integrate with those other sources of data. Because without those sources of data, you really don't, you, it's just too tough. But unfortunately, in this industry, sometimes the integration is harder than it should be, and everybody needs to work to make that easier. 
So when we think about looking at this customer experience and analyzing the data, and it really it centers a lot around satisfaction, what we find is that there really are three big questions that you should be asking of yourself or of your staff or your management's going to be asking of you. The first is how we're doing, and what you see up here is an is a example model of satisfaction. So it's not just about satisfaction, but on the left-hand side, it's those key drivers of satisfaction, and on the right-hand side, it's those outcomes, the behaviors that happen as a result of that experience. So we see the scores that are boxed out in red. Those are, those are how we're doing. We know, we know what we're doing from a performance standpoint. We can benchmark it. We can compare it against ourselves over time, against our peers, and so on. The next question is we want to know what should we do? what we call an impact, we want to know the causal relationship, not the correlation, but the causal relationship if we improve something like navigation or functionality or site performance or product images or pricing, what impact is that going to have on satisfaction and most importantly on their behavior and what they're going to do next. And then finally, why should we do it? So what's the value of improving satisfaction? The goal is not to improve satisfaction for the sake of satisfaction. The goal is to improve satisfaction so it changes their behavior and makes them more loyal and long term. And you do get to some points of diminishing return when satisfaction is really high. So you have to make those ROI decisions and in order to do that, we need to understand what the value is of improving satisfaction. So as we think about this and we look at the, at the past and the data that we have that generally is telling us what has happened on our website, we want to start to look at those analytic data and be able to use it to manage forward, use it to be a step in front of our customer, use it to be a step in front of our competitors so the experience that we're putting out there for, for them is going to truly meet their needs and satisfy them and make them long-term and loyal. So each point of the funnel, each point of the experience they have with you, whether it's a single channel or a multi-channel, is going to absolutely not only be an opportunity for success, but more importantly, an opportunity for failure. And so if we think about a typical pathway of a consumer may take as they move from awareness and acquisition and marketing into browsing, into purchasing or registering or completing a transaction or viewing content, into fulfillment if that's appropriate, to support, to post use, each one of those is not only an opportunity for success, but an opportunity for failure. And if we can eliminate the leakage in the funnel, we can drive our business up exponentially. So that's really key as we think about it. All too often we're waiting for people to raise their hand and tell us. We're looking at just one point of that experience, not all aspects of that experience. You can do a great job marketing, but if you bring them to a crappy site, they're going to leave. You can do a great job on your site, but if you send them a bad product, they're never going to come back. You can have a great product, but if it gets delivered to the wrong house or it gets mangled in the, in the transportation, you're in trouble. It just takes one point of failure for them to go away. Similarly, as we go from channel to channel to channel, we have all of those same problems, right? It may start with an email and turn into a website visit where they may buy or not buy, and then it may end up with fulfillment and service and so on. Each one of those, that customer pathway through your multiple channels and your experiences is an opportunity for failure. So very briefly about 4C, uh, we use a proven methodology and a technology that's been around for a number of years that we continue to evolve and improve upon to really allow you the ability to continuously measure satisfaction across every one of your touch points, whether it be on the, on the life cycle of a website consumer to a mobile or, or tablet user to a call center to an in-store or a location based to help you really understand what things to focus on and what to improve. We work with many different brands across many different industries. We have 35 of the Fortune 100 as clients, about 38 now of the top 100 retailers as clients, six of the top 10 uh, US financial institutions as clients. And with that, we get an enormous amount of data to understand the consumer experience across all these touch points. So we've collected over 70 million completed surveys and, and add about 1.5, 1.6 million a month to our database to truly understand that consumer experience so that we can mine that data and share those results. Ultimately, it's about helping you measuring the effectiveness of your site and the experiences that consumers are having either on your site or in your call center or on your mobile device. It's about understanding what they're about, those users, to better understand and get smarter about them. So taking data and turning it into intelligence. When you can do that, you're able to make the right decisions. Being able to prioritize those improvements because the key to success for any company is understanding how to allocate the resources. Those companies that allocate the resources to the biggest um, biggest areas of return are the woes that are those that are going to win in the long run. And ultimately to be able to benchmark because that's an important aspect for all of us. So it's really about being able to measure every one of those touch points. Every one of those touch points that your consumers are having with your business. Um, I'm going to leave you with five takeaways to just things to think about as you're listening to the rest of the sessions today and tomorrow. You cannot manage what you do not measure. If you're not measuring it, you're not going to be able to manage it. Ultimately the consumer 
has great, great, great power. They're a multi-channel, a multi-device consumer, and you need to understand and try to figure out how to embrace that. You want to be able to measure success not only from your internal perspective, but from their perspective. Did they think the experience they had with you was a success? You want to understand that customer satisfaction is going to drive conversion, loyalty, retention, positive word of mouth, and ultimately financial success. And to be successful, you really only need to do two things. You need to satisfy your customers and be fiscally responsible. Now, those are not two simple things, but that's really is all there is to it for anyone to be successful. With that, here's my contact information. Uh, we have a booth out there. If you'd like to find out more and talk to us more about this concept, please let us know.